Good morning, Central Baptist Church. Here's our announcements for this week. This Wednesday, our student ministry is having a color war event. It's going to be a great time. We want to challenge the students to invite their friends and to wear white t-shirts. It's going to be a great time and a lot of fun with powdered paint. Remember, our Beth Moore simulcast is September 28th from 9.30 a.m. to 4.15. You can pick up your tickets in the church office. Next Sunday is our first annual car show in the Family Life Center parking lot. Entry fee is $10. All proceeds go to missions. There's going to be a lot of fun, awards, food, and a fun time for the whole family. For more info, contact J.D. Strong or the church office. That's all our announcements for this week. Now let's go and worship the Lord together. Oh,
Brother Newt Hambrick, do you have victory in Jesus? Amen. Brother Monty, is there victory in Jesus? Miss Annette, is there victory in Jesus? All right, we're going to get our blood pumping this morning. Since there's victory in Jesus, let's stand up. I need I need somebody to help me with this, though. So I'm going to invite somebody on stage Mr. Dean, would you come up? I saw that hand raised. Come here. Okay, I just want to say this. If you've heard anybody that sings really loud in this place, it's this dude right here. And he is one of the youngest in this room. And my favorite thing on Sunday morning is to see his head thrown back and just singing. So you know what? This morning I'm going to have you help me. Can you do that? We're going to do something called a victory chant, okay? Okay. And the words are going to be back there, and we're going to say them, and then everybody's going to repeat after us. Okay? Can we do that? You ready? J.D., let's have those first words up there. All right, so everybody repeat after Dean and I. Here we go. One, two, ready, and. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take me into the land. You take me into the land. We will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail. Line of Judah, how powerful you are! Hail, hail, line of Judah, how wonderful you are! How wonderful you are! How wonderful you are! How wonderful you are! boy. All right, we sang that this morning. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Now we're going to sing, I'm redeemed by the blood of our Lamb. Let's sing this together. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever I am Redeemed and so happy in Jesus No language my rapture can tell I know that the light of 
of His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, oh redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent His love is the theme of my song Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever I am I know I shall see in His beauty The King in whose law I delight Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps And giveth me songs in the night Redeemed, oh I'm redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed his child and forever I am. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. For this love, we thank you for this love. Thank you for the nail pierced hands, washed me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Oh, sing worthy. The Lamb seated on the throne. We crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious. My God, you are high and lifted up. Oh, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the For the cross, we thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price, oh the price you pay, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came, and you gave amazing grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this love. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. And now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Oh, we'll sing worthy is the Lamb. Seated on the throne, we crown you now 
with many crowns you reign victorious you are high and lifted up Jesus Son of God the dawning of heaven crucified worthy is the Lamb singing worthy is the Lamb worthy is the Lamb worthy is the Sing and worthy We crown you now with many crowns You reign victoria Oh, let's praise him this morning Cause he's high and live Oh, He is Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Worthy is the Lamb Because He lives I can face tomorrow And because He lives All fear is gone Thank you, it's gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because He lives. God sent His Son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon and empty grace. My Savior live. Let's sing. Because He lives, oh, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Oh, it's vanished away. Because I know. future and this life is worth a living just because he lives and life is worth the living just because he Let's praise Him this morning. You may be seated.
what a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Um, we have started a while back. As a matter of fact, I went back and looked at the, the date of when we started this series through uh, 1 Peter, and it was toward the end of uh, or some part time in February. So we've been walking through this book of 1 Peter, and it's not a long book. It's only five chapters long, but it is so packed uh, with, with uh, information, so packed with truth uh, that uh, it's taken us a while to unpack all that's there. And today's scripture is, is no uh, exception to that. Matter of fact, uh, this passage today is one of the, the passages in this book that really drew my heart uh, for us to look at at First Peter uh, together, it spoke to me uh, as as I read that, and I have looked forward and and tried to hurry us a little bit uh, through First Peter, believe it or not, to get uh, to this passage uh, because in, of all the things that we've talked about, as good as it's been to me, this passage holds a a, a great truth and a great insight. And I hope it means as much uh, to you today as it has meant in in, in my life. The title. Uh, today is living with an end time mentality living with an end time mentality uh, so don't get too caught up in, in that title uh, but let's see what the what the scripture uh, says together uh, this morning first peter chapter 4 beginning in in verse 7 here peter writes the end of all things is near therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. And above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. And whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, so living with an end-time mentality. That was the title uh, that I gave to it as I began to to study and and I think captures the uh, essence of this. One of the things that happened as I was looking at I actually read some other sermons uh, that where people took this uh, uh, and, and looked at that. And I like one title, I almost switched titles, uh, because I like this one as well. How to live here until we leave here. How to live here until we leave here. All right, and so between those two, maybe you kind of get a, an idea of what this, this passage uh, is going to be, be about. Now, let me just kind of remind you just a little bit, last week, uh, we talked a little bit about about suffering. Of course, Peter has talked a lot about suffering in, in this book and how uh, that is something that we can expect uh, and can anticipate as a part of our life as believers because we don't live uh, the way the world lives. We kind of swim upstream in, in a lot of, lot of ways, and that then creates some issues for us. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself there. All right, started to preach the whole book again. So let's look at this passage and see what God has to say to us uh, from this. He starts off with just a statement of fact. Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Period. What a powerful statement. The end of all things is near. Is near. Well, what's he talking about? Or what does this mean? The end of all things is near. Well, one thing uh, that it has to, to do with in an application for us is it just speaks to the, the brevity of life. Now, I've really been uh, surprised, pleased, blessed. I don't know what the right word is, uh, but to look at how many um, cen- centurions, what's the right word? People that live to be 100. Uh, that we have in in Carthage, uh, we see a lot of longevity. But if you were to talk to to someone today, and we have several, I think, in our congregation today who have exceeded 90 or 80 uh, this morning, I think as you speak to people uh, who are on the upper ends of those numbers that we look toward in age, they would tell you life goes by fast. 
Life goes by fast. Uh, I, I talked even this weekend, uh, someone that I knew from, from Hallsville, that as I was leaving there, that they had had a, a new baby not too long. Uh, and uh, I said, well, how's the baby doing? And she said, the baby's three. Uh, whoa, you know, uh, so uh, that was Emily. Uh, but anyway, uh, life just flies, flies by, the brevity of, of life. And so Peter says to us, don't think you're going to be here forever. Don't think that you're going to be on this earth forever. Uh, the end is near. It's nearer than you think. Even if we live a, a, a full life, and we're not even guaranteed that, but life is short uh, there. And so that's part of it. But really, the bigger meaning of what he is saying there is he's talking about the imminent return of Christ. These New Testament believers lived with the expectation that the Lord Jesus Christ could return at any time. And that is a truth that has been passed on from generation to generation, that the Lord could return at any time. Do you believe that? You know, the Lord could return before this message is up. The Lord could return before I finish the next sentence. Uh, word. But anyway, just giving him a shot uh, there in case he wanted to do that. That's why you do what? Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. And we're to be hungry for that. This world is not our home. And we're looking for that return of Christ. And all through this book, Peter has been reminding us that this world is not our home. Don't get too rooted here. We live here. We're to be salt and light here. We have a mission here. But our home is heaven. And that's where we are headed. So the burdens and the trials and the, the distraction of this life, uh, we need to guard against uh, those things. And, and this is something that we see a, a theme throughout the New Testament is this idea of the imminent return of Christ. And there's numerous verses. I just real quickly uh, picked one. First John, the Apostle John uh, writing says, The world is passing away and also its lust." But the one who does the will of God lives forever. We go to heaven. Children, and he's calling us children. We're children of God. It is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrist have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. So they remind us time and time again, you and I are to live with that anticipation and that belief that the Lord could return at any time. And what happens, though, because the Lord has tarried, um, we begin to think, well, he's not coming. Uh, or it may be a, a long, long time. And that's what happened the first time uh, the Lord came. Uh, th those Old Testament Jewish believers uh, in, in God, in Yahweh God, knew that a Messiah was coming. The Scriptures had prophesied that. But they kind of got lackadaisical in, in that so the, to the point that when the Lord came, so many of them missed it, missed it. They weren't ready for it. They, though they talked about it and studied it, it really wasn't an expectation, so they missed it when it came. It was at least part of what took place. He was different than what they were expecting too, which, by the way, I think the second coming is going to be a little different than what we're expecting too, but that's another sermon. Um, we're t to be reminded that the Lord is, could come any soon. Martin Luther, the great theologian of, of days gone by, says, live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose today, and is coming back tomorrow. There's the, to be this effect in our lives of that belief that, that the Lord could come at any time that colors everything that we do. So what does that look like? Uh, to, to believe that the, the Lord is coming soon, how does that affect us? How does that look in, in our lives? What are we supposed to do as a result of that? Well, first of all, it's not that we're to have an obsession uh, with charts and uh, maps and eschatology and timetables. I mean, those things are okay to study and to look at, but, but don't get so caught up in that. And we're not to, to go live on a mountaintop, so, you know, and... Things like that. And for sure, you know, we're not to walk around with placards, you know, saying the, the end is near. That's not what Scripture tells us uh, how we're to live 
as those who are expecting the Lord to come. So these next few verses, Peter gives us how we're to live knowing that the end is near. So let's, let's look at these verses. First of all, he says we're to live life sensibly. Live life sensibly. You remember in verse 7, as he began, the end of all things is near. Therefore, therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. He has two phrases in there. He says, be of sound judgment and be of sober spirit. How are we to live? Well, these two verses, these two words, phrases, refer to a calm, sound, stable, and vigorous thinking. Sound mind. Uh, we're to be thoughtful people. We're to, to, to not just be reactive to things in the world. We're to be intentional. And that second word, a sober, uh, certainly literally taken and talks about not being uh, drunk, but actually applied in this, ex, uh, in this setting, in this verse, means to be rational and controlled, to have sound thinking, to have self-control in our lives. We see this same idea. Paul picks up on it uh, when he writes in 2 Timothy 1.7. He said, For the Spirit of God, the Spirit that God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and then here's the word, self-discipline. That idea that we are controlled in our, our minds and our hearts and our actions of, of how we live. We're very intentional in the things that we do because we know that the end is near. We're living sensibly, not doing crazy things or, or whatever. It's a sensible life that we live. And he even gives another phrase there, for the purpose of prayer. We are to stay connected to God in our everyday life. It's not just when we come to church on Sundays or those times of the day that we set apart to connect our minds and our hearts with the Lord through prayer and Bible reading or devotional reading. No, we are to keep our minds in control so we can stay connected with God, to walk in the Spirit uh, throughout the day. This is the idea, again, that Paul picks up on in 1 Thessalonians when he says, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean we walk around with our eyes closed and our hands folded and, and praying. No, it's this connection that we have with the Lord. That in all things, uh, as we go through the day, as, as a situation presents itself, you know, we, we can commit that to the Lord. Or if there's something that's troubling that's happening, we can say, Lord, I need some help in this moment. Perhaps we face a time of temptation and we say, Lord, I need some strength right now. Hold me close because I'm doing battle in my heart. Maybe we have a temptation to gossip or uh, to get angry in a time that we shouldn't get angry. Or maybe we have a temptation not to get angry in a time when we should get angry. Whatever it may be that we ask God to help us and, and it just becomes that natural part of our life that we're connected to the Lord as those things take, take place. Back when we started this study in the first part of this year, we, we talked about three different themes that we see in the book of First Peter. And one of them uh, really connects with this today. It says, In a day when persons are becoming too worldly-minded, Peter recalls us to the heavenly and eternal outlook and reminds Christians that we are but pilgrims and strangers. Here, you didn't get the... But there it goes, right there. Uh, we are not of this world. We're passing through on our way to heaven. And I think you're going to remember this guy. We talked about him, and, and he was reminding us that you and I are aliens in this world. This is, is not our home. Heaven is our home. But knowing that, as we go through this world, we are to live sensibly. Well, what does live sensibly look like? Uh, just some ideas. We're not to be consumed with self-indulgence. It's not that we sit around and just see how much we can get and fulfilling all of our desires and wants and, you know, the idea of having a, a bucket list, which there's nothing wrong with a bucket list and enjoying life. But if that's what the center of your life is, if that's what the 
focus of your life is, then you've missed the point of following the Lord in this world. That there is an urgency to life. God has a mission for us. There are people God has placed in your sphere of influence, where you work, in your neighborhood, in your family, that you're to be salt and and light with. There are people in my life that I pray for, and hopefully there are people in your life that you're praying, God, my nephew, my grandson, uh, my spouse, my parent has not yet accepted you in their life, or they're away from you, and God, I lift them up to you. Work in their life. Bring your spirit to contend in in their heart. Bring other people that can be uh, uh, an encouragement in their life to point them to you. People that are on our heart constantly, knowing that the Lord could come at any time. This is the urgency. The Lord could come at any time. And those who have not yet made that decision to accept the Lord as their Savior will not go to heaven. Can I say it? They'll go to hell. There is an urgency to life because the Lord could come at any time. We're to face daily living with eternal values. How we use our time, how we use our resources, uh, the decisions that we make. Thinking about how does this affect eternity? How does this affect God's mission for me in my life? And realizing that death is, is not the end of life. All these things are part of living sensibly. Living sensibly. But he goes on in this verse. He doesn't stop there. That's part of what it means uh, to live with an end-time mentality is that we live sensibly. But he goes on and he says, Live life with abundant love. With abundant love. Man, I like this verse. It challenges me, it corrects me, and it calls me. Well, that's a sermon right there. It's three C's. That just happened right there in the moment. I like it. Something, write that down, Lynn. Um, I like this verse. It says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins and be hospitable to one another without complaint. Live life with abundant love. Now, it starts off with a phrase that probably doesn't mean what it says. It says, above all. Now, above all means that this is very, very important. It's the most important thing. But I'm sure that's not what God was inspiring Peter to write. Uh, Surely there are things more important than love, right? Can you think of a few? Um, I mean, good theology, um, Come into church, um, tithing. Can we can we at least put tithing up there, please? Up there, you know. Surely there's something more important than love. No, thank you, whoever was giving me all the no's back there. He says after in this book where he's dealt with things like theology, he's dealt with. Uh, how we're to relate to to one another and some of the issues in the church. All these things that as he's moving now to the end of this book, the Holy Spirit inspires Peter to say, believers, above all. Would you say above all with me? Above all. Above all. Keep fervent in your love. Now, this is probably the only place in Scripture that this is mentioned, unless you maybe look at 1 Corinthians 13, perhaps one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but let's just look at the first four verses there. Paul writes, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I do not have what? Love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have 
love, it profits me nothing. Above all, above all, Jesus himself said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. In our mission statement that that we have adopted as our church, we say, love God, love others, help others love God. That is so important. It is essential. He says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. This word fervent speaks of an intensity, a deliberateness. We're to to deliberately seek to, to love one another. It's not something that just happens casually. It's not something casual. And you know what? Love is not always convenient, is it? Showing love, having ministry, caring for others is not always convenient there. Fervently love. One another. We see this same idea in First Peter. He said this earlier in the book. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. He likes that idea, and he's coming back to it now at the end of the book, that we are to fervently love one another. And then he says a, a very interesting uh, statement there, right there. Because love covers a multitude of sins. We're to fervently love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Brother Newt, I need you to help me after church to really understand what that means there. I think it's a pretty important statement. I at least get this out of it, that there's something connected in how we relate to one another and how God relates to us in dealing with us even in our sins. Love, that fervent love that we have for one another, has some connection with how God relates to us and forgiving us of our sins. There's a, another verse of Scripture, Matthew six, fourteen and 15, after the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, it talks about asking God to forgive us of our sins. And then Jesus says, For if you forgive others for their transgressions or sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But don't miss verse 15. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. There is something connected about how we relate to those around us, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, the the love that we have and that practical uh, outpouring of that love and forgiveness to how God relates to us in our lives. And then he closes this with the phrase, be hospitable to one another without complaint. This idea of fervent love, it's not just an idea, something we talk about, not just something we put in our mission statement and forget. It's to show itself in very practical ways. If you love somebody, be hospitable to them. Care about them. Help them. If they need a place to stay, let them come in your house. Let them sit at your table. Be nice to them. You know, that would be a good place to start. Let's just be nice to one another. Amen? Amen? You know, that's so different than the world these days. If we as believers could just be hospitable and nice to one another, people would go, what's going on with those Christians? You know, it would be something that God could use. So love is expressed in practical ways there. And, of course, we know this verse, 1 John 3.18. says, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we're seeing in this that we're to live life sensibly, and to live life with abundant love. And then he closes this passage by saying, live life with service to the glory of God. Did you pick up on that, the last couple of verses? He says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, 
is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. You see, God gives us all of our gifts in life. Gifts of friends and family, the gift of eternal life. Those are gifts that God gives to all of us, the sunshine and the and the rain, all these things that God pours out upon us because he, he loves us are gifts that we all share. But this verse reminds us that there are, it's a special gift that when you accepted the, the Lord into your life and you were born again, the Holy Spirit brought with him into your life some special gift. You have a gift that I don't have. You may say, I could never get up and, and, and preach or, or, or teach. Well, that's fine. That's a gift that the Lord has given me, I think. But he's given you a gift also. And, it, and one of them, he says, in speaking, and then he talks about serving. Maybe what you do is set up tables. Maybe what you do is greet people. Serve, find some way to, to serve. There are a lot of things that happen around here that nobody knows, and I love that. People that aren't elected or appointed. There's just a job that needs to be done, and they do it. Get here early on Sunday morning. You'll see Gene Prince with a leaf blower in his hand blowing off the sidewalks so that when we come to church, the sidewalks don't have leaves and needles on them. When you walk in and, and you want a cup of coffee, David Hudman has come up here this week and filled up all the water canisters and refilled all the little coffee things so that when you get here on Sunday morning, there's water and coffee in the carriage for you to have. And on and on and on. We've got Sunday school teachers studying lessons. We've got people making visits in homes, uh, people in their Sunday school class or somebody that they know, people praying for people that we don't even know about. They're not on the prayer room list, but they're in their homes and they pray... Things that people are doing to serve God because of a gift that God has placed in their life. We all have a gift. and We all are to use those gifts to make a difference in the body of Christ. Some of them are more noticeable. Some of them are less noticeable. But they all are important. God gives each of us a special gift. You have something special and unique to offer the church and to the kingdom of God. And this last little bullet there is part of the adventure, part of the journey of the Christian life is discovering what that gift is and then learning how you can use it. When you discover that and you find a way to begin to use that for the kingdom of God, it's an exciting thing. It's not just sitting any longer. I'm a part of what God is, is doing there. We can help you with that, but ultimately it's you seeking God and following after Him. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. And whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. The end of all things is not that Central Baptist gets glory. The end of all things is not that the pastor or staff gets some kind of glory because of the good things that God is doing here. The end of all things, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is that as we begin to live the way that God would have us to live, with this end-time mentality, as we begin to serve together, making an impact for His kingdom. The end of that, my friends, is that God gets glory. Let me tell you why that is so important. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, that people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because it's important to realize, my friends, that the King is coming. The King is coming. The King is coming.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word and this reminder that the end is near. The end is near. That you are coming again. And that should impact how we live each day. Every thought, every decision, every motive of our heart. Father, that we should allow your spirit to so transform our minds and our hearts that we are in tune with your spirit, that we're walking with you each day, looking forward with anticipation of of your coming. And that, God, that that helps us to, to not be so rooted in this world that we miss those things that you might want for us. But that, God, that we're being used by you. Even in a word that we might speak to a stranger, to an action that we take, God, that we are your vessels being used salt and light in this community, lifting up the name of Christ so that all men may be drawn to you. We pray and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to have a time of response. This is your opportunity to right there where you are to pray to the Lord, to come forward and allow one of our staff members to pray with you or to talk with you more about how to join this church or how to accept the Lord as your Savior. This is your opportunity to respond. You follow however the Lord might be.